Hi, it's Clarion Matheson, Director of Neuroscience Medical Operations at Lehigh Valley Hospital. I'm here today with Erin Conahan, our Clinical Nurse Specialist at Lehigh Valley Health Network. And this is part two of a series of three lectures that we are doing as annual stroke updates. So the title of this lecture is um, Need for Speed, Rapid Triage, Transport, and Treatment. So there are a lot of things that are new with stroke care, and there's some things that are not quite new, but are continued um, drivers of why we do what we do. So the incidence of stroke continues to rise as people get older, and estimated 795,000 Americans will suffer a new or recurrent stroke this year. That comes out to be one in every 40 seconds. While we are Advancing in our treatment of stroke, we are not really advancing in our ability to decrease the incidence of stroke. Stroke is still the number one leading cause of adult disability. So if you meet a stroke survivor, they're likely to tell you that they would rather have not um, had a stroke at all because it certainly does leave them with some reminders of, of what happened in their brain. So a little bit of information on the physiological impact of stroke on your um, brain circuitry. So every minute matters is, is the takeaway message. So if you look at this busy slide and you look at how many neurons are, are lost each minute, so about 2 million neurons are lost with each minute we delay reestablishing blood flow for that brain. So this translates to, in about an hour, you've aged your brain about 3.6 years. So on average, most of our patients delay seeking any medical treatment for that first hour, and they've already incurred an, a 3.6 um, aging process on their brain. So again, the emphasis on reversing this or lessening the severity of this as quickly as possible cannot be understated. So one of the goals in stroke care is to minimize the actual um, brain injury and to maximize that ability for that patient's recovery. And in that process, everybody plays a very important role in rapidly getting treatment on board for that patient. So when we're out in the community, we are constantly messaging how important it is to activate medical emergency assistance um, using the 911 system. We recognize that in time-sensitive emergencies like MI, like trauma, like stroke, partnering with our EMS colleagues is the quickest way to get help on scene and to, again, begin the process of getting treatment to that patient. So when EMS responds, they are able to actively engage at that scene, begin to gather necessary information, and to message ahead to a receiving facility that they have a suspected stroke patient. There are eight Ds of stroke care, and you may be familiar with these through ACLS protocol, through any American Heart course that you may have taken. And this really starts with rapid identification that there is a problem, dispatching of early assistance using 911, immediate um, delivery of that patient from the scene to the, to the hospital um, by EMS, appropriate triage once you are at a receiving destination, gathering of important information in under that 60 minutes so that we can get that door to target treatment in under 60. And then again, gathering that information and the necessary expertise of, of physicians to select the appropriate therapy for that patient. When we talk about drug, we talk about treatment. Um, TPA has been approved since 1996, so it's over a decade old with experience in treating stroke patients. And then intraarterial strategies, which have been around um, with newer generation devices since 2004, offer another um, means that we can help reperfuse injured brain. And then disposition, rapid admission to a stroke unit or critical care unit. So again, limiting that time in the emergency department and getting that patient to an area that can fully focus 
on that patient's immediate care. Field assessment of stroke is a hot topic right now. And there is a lot of emphasis on what is the best tool to assess um, that patient in the field to determine if this might be a potential stroke. For years, as part of BLS training, we have taught the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. This, too, has become the public message that the American Heart and National Stroke Association use to teach lay people to recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke. We use the mnemonic FAST to indicate F for facial droop, having the patient smile and looking for symmetry, A for holding your arms out and counting to um, 10 to see if um, you're able to keep both sides out there looking for motor weakness, speech, having that patient uh, repeat a sentence to, again, identify if they're having any kind of um, deficit in speech. And then T, we add in there for time of onset and time to call 911. Recently, in our region, we have adopted um, the use of the MEND exam um, as part of our acute stroke life support course. Um, this takes components of the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale and adds a few additional pieces from the um, NIH Stroke Scale. This gives us the ability to assess the mental status, some of the cranial nerves, and a little bit more focus on limb weakness. This is meant to be a second part exam. So Cincinnati Pre-Hospital would be done on scene. And then in route, as you're performing your secondary assessment in the back of the ambulance, you would perform the um, repeat the Cincinnati and then add in the components of the MEND. This again helps us to identify more um, completely what kinds of deficit that that patient may have and may helpful, hopefully improve the, the communication and the handoff uh, between different levels of care. So in summary, the EMS role in the stroke system is a very, very important um, partnership. They are the first medical provider with direct patient contact. Um, the EMS care has uh, significant consequences in that patient's subsequent care. So for EMS providers, um, they triage the patient first. So it's so important that they're aware of um, stroke centers and what the different actual capabilities of local hospitals as well as EMS system is. Um, this is so important as we move patients af after they first start TPA, if they move from as an inter-facility hospital transport, as well as if they are in the field and they recognize that that patient may have an exclusion criteria for IV TPA and they're able to reroute that patient um, using your medical support. A little bit about pre-hospital stroke alert. Um, in our area, we activate pre-hospital stroke alerts for patients presenting with symptoms less than six hours. Um, this is important because it's beyond that three-hour IV TPA. And this is due to the fact that with mechanical intervention, we can go out as far as eight hours from the start of stroke symptoms. So this really is a game changer, and this is new information that we want to be sure is, is out there because it could really save the life of a friend or a family member that has a stroke emergency. So things that we ask our EMS partners, get the last time known well. Um, this is the time that the patient was last seen normal. So if that patient went to bed at 9 p.m. last night and awoke at 7 o'clock this morning and kind of fell out of bed because they had right-sided weakness, um, you would need to work with, was that patient seen any time during the night um, to help identify that time last seen normal? If nobody saw that patient or talked to that patient in the morning before 7 o'clock, the last known normal would revert back to that 9 p.m. bedtime. Meds. Medication history is very important and has gotten more complicated as we've added new treatments for atrial fibrillation. So used to be if you just knew whether they were on Coumadin or Warfarin or not, 
it was sort of self, it was sort of sufficient. Now with the novel oral anticoagulants that are out there, you need to ask about meds such as Perdaxa, Xeralto, um, Eliquis. Um, as these are medications that would preclude that patient from getting IV TPA, but would not knock them out for getting mechanical uh, reperfusion therapy. Any history of a die allergy or diabetes is important, as many of these advanced procedures require us to give um, sufficient amounts of dye to identify the blood vessels that are a target for reperfusion treatment. It doesn't mean that they will be excluded for treatment, it just means that we have to get that prep on board um, and get that patient adequately prepared for that study. Family contact. It kind of sounds like a no-brainer to say get a phone number of a family member or a friend or someone on scene that saw what happened with that patient. Since time is such an a important variable in the treatment of these patients, oftentimes we may be moving to treatment before the family actually gets to the hospital. So getting that cell phone number or bringing a family member, if at all possible, is very important so that we can, again, reestablish any questions that might influence the treatment choice of that physician. You will hear a lot about this concept of large vessel occlusion. This has been a very hot topic in 2015 with acute stroke treatment and moves right along as we are um, starting to 2016. So for patients that have a large vessel occlusion, we now have five randomized controlled trials that have proven the efficacy and an actual preference of mechanical reperfusion for large vessel occlusion. And by large vessel, we mean the carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery, um, the basilar artery. These are all large arteries that um, are responsible for blood supply within your brain that we can get to with advanced catheter-based intervention. Typically, these patients will present with a clinical exam involving face, arm, and leg, and most usually speech. So if that patient has an NIH stroke scale greater than 8, these patients are potentially mechanical reperfusion candidates. So stroke treatment options. So we've really evolved the treatment of stroke um, since the approval of TPA in 1996. So as far as um, medical management, IV TPA remains the only FDA-approved clot-busting medication used for stroke patients. Patients typically need to be within that zero to three hour window, and in certain circumstances, we will go out as far as four and a half hours. There has to be no other contraindications associated with the use of that drug, so there is a safety checklist that is used each and every time as physicians consider the options for these patients. Interarterial thrombolysis is available at facilities with um, physicians that have special training and have access to either a cath lab or a neurointerventional um, laboratory where they can, similar to what you're seeing in a, a MI alert, go up directly into the brain and intervene on the artery that has a blockage. This allows us to optimize the treatment choices for those large vessel occlusions. We're able to go up there and directly balloon open, um, retrieve that clot, reestablish blood flow in very short time, um, which again allows less brain to be injured by that um, reduction in blood flow. Intraarterial thrombolysis, not done as often um, anymore, but that requires the physician to directly infuse the IV TPA into the artery directly at the site of the clot. They're able to use smaller doses. They're able to more um, carefully monitor that patient. Um, but honestly, with the improvement in mechanical thrombectomy devices, they're actually able to get up there and remove the clot quicker than they are able to dissolve the clot. So why this is so very important, um, this slide here shows you that 
after large meta-analysis of patients treated with IV TPA, we really see in the large vessel occlusion only 35 to 40 percent of patients are actually helped by that TPA drug. And you can sort of see how this breaks down by the territory. So it's a very small chance that IV TPA is going to open up a blocked carotid artery, as you can see um, with the low percentage yield um, recorded here. If that patient has a middle cerebral artery, you can see the chances are a little bit better, but still not super terrific. And then a clot that's in the vertebral basal or posterior circulation, you can see it's about a 31 percent um, effectiveness that that medication may have in opening that blocked blood vessel. So differences in hospital capabilities. You as our um, colleagues that are out in the field dealing with outside hospitals, it's so important that you understand differences in hospital capabilities and understand if that patient is being moved to a facility for reperfusion treatment, how time sensitive that that emergency is. So most primary stroke centers have 24-7 availability to give IV TPA, to get a CAT scan, and to connect with some sort of tertiary facility if needed. Most of the primary stroke centers in our areas have established referral patterns with comprehensive stroke centers so that if their patient needs to go to a higher level of care, they have a system in place to move that forward. Comprehensive stroke centers have capability of doing advanced neuroimaging. So we can look to see, is that blockage in an artery that we can get to? Is there brain tissue damage that precludes the benefit of opening that blocked blood vessel? We also have a dedicated neuro ICU where patients are cared for by nurses who have had advanced training in neurologic assessment. And then we have endovascular reperfusion therapy available 24-7. We have experience with complex multi-system patients. So these patients that are in our neuro ICU often have had brain hemorrhage, they've had um, coagulopathy, they've had surgery, we are able to manage swelling that may occur from injured brain, we're able to monitor intracranial pressure, and we're able to uh, care for that multi-system patient. As I mentioned before, telestroke is one way that we bridge caring for our patients. So I just want to share with you who our present partners are and what their status are, whether they're primary stroke centers or not stroke centers at all. So presently on telestroke, we have um, Lehigh Valley Hazleton and Lehigh Valley 17th Street and Lehigh Valley Muhlenberg. All have the capability to, to have telestroke deployed if there's not a neurologist in-house to manage that patient's emergency. We are connected with Easton Hospital, um, Blue Mountain Health System, Naden Hutton and Palmerton, and then also Sacred Heart Hospital. We also are connected with Schuylkill Medical Center. They are not a stroke center. All the others are primary stroke centers. So at Schuylkill Medical Center, we have telestroke at the East Norwegian campus and that at South Jackson. There are three other hospitals that refer to us as well. They are all primary stroke centers, so Potsdam Hospital, Pocono Medical Center, and Grandview. Um, each of these three hospitals may have telestroke arrangements with other CS comprehensive stroke centers, but when time is brain and they need to send patients to the quickest, nearest facility, geographically, you are going to see some overlapping that occurs as we look to sort of build a system approach to stroke care similar to what we experience in trauma. I am now going to turn it over to Erin who is going to talk a little bit about um, what occurs when we need to move patients rapidly from one level of care to another. So telestroke is one way for us to quickly get a neurospecialist to the bedside. Telestroke enables our neurologists who may be on site at a Lehigh Valley campus or even at home to visually look at that patient. Um, using video capability, the, pac the patient is able to be assessed 
by the neurologist to help render a decision in terms of treatment. In addition to doing a video assessment, there is an imaging cloud that allows a transfer of the CAT scan so that the neurologist may view that and help render an opinion with even more information. The whole idea of getting to that neurospecialist sooner is that we can start IVTPA sooner or get the patient transferred out if need be to another facility for endovascular rescue. Again, as Clarion mentioned, the sooner we get any stroke treatment started to the onset of symptoms, the better chance of that patient having a good outcome. Typically, we have looked at our door-to-needle time of 60 minutes, and that's been well established since the beginning of TPA delivery. As more centers are becoming primary stroke certified, it's easier to meet this benchmark. So the American Stroke Association in the last year has raised the bar to get that door-to-needle time of 45 minutes. Looking at reviews of patients entered into the Get With The Guidelines database, it is clear that giving TPA within 45 minutes can be done efficiently and safely for these patients. So again, the sooner we get that treatment started, the sooner that patient um, can get a better recovery. If we look at what happens when patients are first dropped off at a primary stroke center, um, we can see that there's multiple steps that need to happen. In our area, we have, as Clarion mentioned, many stroke centers. So if you're geographically within 20 minutes of transport time to a comprehensive stroke center, the current recommendation from the American Stroke Association is to go to that comprehensive center. We'll look at why in a little bit. But if you think about even an established primary stroke center is going to take 45 to 60 minutes to work up that patient before they can even give drug, that extra 20 minute transport may be well worth the brain that's saved for that patient. Again, understanding what our, what our hospitals are capable of will help us deliver patients to the correct uh, center. Currently, the American Stroke Association is looking at EMS routing for recommendations, but it is difficult given that everything is governed by state and also local municipalities. But when we're looking at our patients, some things that may help us make that determination in the field is at pre-hospital stroke scale. So if your patient is having a severe stroke, if you're seeing face, arm, leg, and speech involvement, that may be a patient that you would route to a comprehensive center, understanding that the size of that stroke may be larger. Time of onset is also key. Primary stroke centers can deliver that IVTPA in that first zero to three hour range. And many, many centers also have the capability to go out as far as four and a half hours. But if that patient's onset of symptoms started at three, three hours ago, it may be beneficial to get them to that comprehensive stroke center because they may need to go on to that endovascular treatment, which will open the treatment window for them. Other important information to consider when we're looking at where to take a patient is if they've had recent surgery. If they've had recent surgery within 14 days, or in some cases up to three months for trauma, MI, or other stroke, that patient may not be a candidate for TPA, which would leave endovascular therapy as their only option. Any patient that may be on warfarin or one of the new novel anticoagulants also may have limited ability to receive TPA. So directing them immediately to a comprehensive stroke center may be in that patient's best interest. Time is brain. So again, you'll hear this over and over whenever you get a stroke lecture. But just to kind of drive it home, we're going to look at the care of a patient. He's a 51-year-old male who was found at work with a right gaze and left arm weakness. His last known normal was about 9 o'clock, and he was found by his uh, co-workers around 1030. Um, they could clearly establish who had seen him last. 
He came in with an NIH stroke scale of 13. Um, he did have arm weakness and eventually did have leg weakness, and he had slurred speech when he got to the ER. So his symptoms had worsened in route. Quickly, he was taken to CAT scan in the emergency room within 12 minutes. The stroke team was at CAT scan while this was being reviewed and could see that there was no hemorrhage, so the TPA was ordered immediately. We never want to preclude a patient who presents within the window for TPA to get TPA, even if endovascular treatment is planned. At this time, we were still delivering TPA before taking that patient to the intraarterial suite to see if there were any improvements. This patient didn't have any improvements. Um, so he was quickly taken to endovascular, where they were able to remove the clot within 29 minutes. His overall time to revascularization was 122 minutes from onset. And if you think about the hour that it typically takes to work up that stroke patient and the hour of TPA delivery, right there's 120 minutes. So between the TPA and endovascular treatment, he was able to be opened at 122 minutes. Looking at his angiogram, we can see on the left-hand side, this is a carotid artery coming up. This is a division of that middle cerebral artery right here. And right in here, you can see where there's no blood flow getting out to this part of the brain. After four passes using a combination of catheters, blood flow was reestablished to that right cerebral hemisphere. Again, looking at how else can we speed up treatment to our patients. One thought is instead of bringing patients to treatment, we bring the treatment to the patient. So within the United States, this is being done at Cleveland Clinic in Texas and also in Arizona. These are mobile stroke treatment units. Typically, they are staffed with a nurse practitioner, they usually have a driver who is also CAT scan tech co-trained so that they're able to run the imaging piece and uh, oftentimes a medic for additional support. The back of these units contain a CAT scanner. That way we can differentiate patients that have hemorrhage from no hemorrhage. What typically occurs is that when the stroke alert is called, the mobile stroke unit will meet the local unit in the field where they will transfer the patient to the mobile unit, get that CAT scan. And then they also have a telemedicine connection, oftentimes via a tablet, to a stroke neurologist who's able to review the images, view the patient's history as they would in an emergency room, and make that decision whether or not to start TPA. If that patient would end up being a hemorrhage, they could also make the decision to initiate antihypertensive therapy as well as reversal of anticoagulation in the field. If the patient is going to be transferred on to a comprehensive stroke center, the patient would stay with that mobile stroke unit and move with the team to the site. If the decision is made that that patient could get TPA and return to a local PSC or that maybe the patient doesn't qualify for acute stroke treatment, um, if they're outside the window, for instance, then that local ambulance would transport that patient to the local primary stroke center. So as you can see, there are many, many new findings in stroke that's advancing our care. Thank you for your participation and care of the stroke patient.